Good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you to another exciting edition of Tosin and Friends. I'm Luwa Tosin Akiride, and today we have the opportunity to interview Professor Ebida Kobe, who is currently an independent non-executive director of Zenith Bank, and he was also the former vice chancellor of the University of Lagos, Unilag, and also Federal University Ndufu Alike in Ebony State, on the topic entitled The Role of the Educational Sector in Providing Lasting Solutions to Nigeria's Social Economic and Developmental Problems. So, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Tosi. How are you doing today, sir? And how have you been keeping safe during this whole COVID-19 period? Well, I'm doing okay today. I've been quite busy today. Yeah. I've been doing a lot of Zoom meetings and uh, attending to one or two webinars. So today mm -hmm. I've been quite busy, uh, which is good for me. Mm -hmm. We started early with an exercise and I'm keeping safe. I stay home most of the time. I mean, you can see your meeting me right here and then we'll try to create those things that we need outside the home, right in the home here. Thank Thanks to IT. I'm yeah. so grateful to IT. Yeah. And I mean, you are also a scientist, so we should be thanking you too. So let's go straight into the interview right about now. Yes. So as an internationally renowned professor, what's your general assessment of our Nigerian educational system, judging from the primary level to the tertiary level? Well, thank you very much. This is a matter that has been a big concern to me. I haven't trained in this country. I haven't had the opportunity to also train overseas and to teach also overseas and teach also in Nigeria and I haven't had the trend. Look at the trend in educational policy and the type of infrastructure that is available to support growing boarding number of, of the academy. I, I, I think things has not been going very well in this country the way it should have been. At first you would think perhaps the population had been the real challenge that the level of population has been quite high so that you cannot cope. But I've had the opportunity to visit other countries, for example, India, for example, China, even Korea. And we've seen that really, if we organize very well, population is not the issue. More so that we are blessed with talent, but we have created roadblocks towards achieving the best. The question I always ask myself, why is it that a quote-unquote poor undergraduate, poor undergraduate from my perspective, is somebody who had a top class or a past degree, would leave this country and go to a place like United States. And by the time you see him in two years, he's settled down, he's a gentleman, he's doing a reasonable job, and he's getting every support that he has. What, what is the problem? So obviously, the problem must have been the environment that does not accommodate people like that. You can see that even people with better performance, they don't stay in this country. Uh, while we are trying to throw away a lot of our graduates, a country like Canada is welcoming them with all the fanfare that they can get. Even our medical doctors that used to be a no-no in this country, they now bring them in, uh, they go through some training and they do some examination, and in two years, they are passed. So something is wrong with the way we do our business here. Thank you very much for that explicit answer. So, I mean, you spoke about roadblocks. I would like you to specifically mention the roadblocks. Is it coming from the government's angle or individuals? Elucidate ba more. Basically, the roadblocks are coming from government. For example, I mean, one of the things I struggled with when I was vice chancellor was this quota system. You know, um, you, you get a minimum cutoff point and then you now rank every other candidate in terms of merit, in terms of other performance. At one time or the other, it was allowed that certain universities would do their business based on merit, but everything has been changed now. And it's quite sad that, especially in the cosmopolitan city like Lagos, that quite a few people will feel that our policy has not been inclusive. I want to see, and I'm praying that I will see during my lifetime, that quota system will be totally scrapped. I, I, I feel what we need to do is to do what we've done before. This same country, at one time, they had challenges with getting people who are trained in science. So they set up what they call the Federal School of Science, and they bring people in who are trained in science and that is it. I would have thought that even within our current political system, that those states that are weak, and there are quite a lot of them, it's not just what, you know, most people think 
most states that are weak in terms of Nigerian background should be helped. You bet should support them to create remedial schools. I also remember even when those of us now who have worked and got to big places, if your parents target that they want you to attend King's College or Government College or Igubi College or St. Gregory's College, even in Lagos here, when you finish your standard six, they send you to a special coaching school. You spend about one year there, you take the exam, you go there. So, it has always been the provision from the beginning to coach and train those who are not up to the level. They will be up to the level. What it costs is additional time for them, number one, to be disciplined because they will not be at home and to be able to get a teacher who is going to take them through. So, I, I think that's what we should do rather than glorify quota system because that glorification of quota system has gone to something else. To the best of my ability, I try so much to encourage brilliant students to come into the university not only in Lagos, even when I had the opportunity to start up the Federal University in Yungufu Aliki. Yes, I can tell you that from the candidates we have, it was based mostly on merit. That's what, and we are seeing the benefits now. Quota is not good for us. It kills the initiative and it does not allow even those people you want to help to attain greater heights. Yeah, so you spoke quite extensively on why quota system is not good for us. Yeah, that's one of the roadblocks. Yeah, as a nation. But you would admit that it's a very different difficult thing to combat at the moment in the country. So, well, you no, know, I mean, I've heard a lot of political analysts say that mm -hmm. combating or fighting against the quota system in the country at the moment is going to be very difficult, yeah, because of some tribes of no, the country. I no, don't, I don't think so. What, okay. I'm, saying, what yeah. I'm saying is, look, support those states. If you know the amount of money that is in UBEC, Universal Basic uh, Education Commission, you can solve all this problem. I mean, if it can be easily solved, then why has it not been because done? They're not looking at it because you see, let me tell you if I'm a teacher in a class, at the end of my class, okay, I showed my students the questions I'm going to ask in an examination. Why do they have to read? Why do they have to have special effort? To go to the library. It has happened to me. We've seen it. Even at the University of Lagos, at one time there was so much talk about giving students of teacher preferences. Of course, the students didn't do well because they thought that they are going to get preferences. If you recall, this was the time whereby it was Sifova Sonjo who was president at that time. He says, listen, he doesn't believe in giving preferences to children of teachers. So that was out. It used to be 10% reserved for them. And the kids were not doing well. But now with that 10%, everybody struggles. And they are doing excellently well because there are internal structures that were designed to train them to the best of their ability. All those great schools that we hear about, St. Paul Zaria in those days, uh, uh, Government College Umaya, Government College Ibadan, what do they do? They have special teachers that know how to coach those students for examination and they are doing well. So we can establish such institutions all over the United States, especially in those areas where they, they have problems. Okay, so we've spoken quite extensively on the quote the system yeah. in the country. Yeah. What are the other roadblocks? I would like well, you to mm. mention them. Because of course, the system. other roadblock is the lack of infrastructure. I mean, to be fair, when we went to school, our schools were beautiful. They were well built, well painted. In fact, I can tell you, our schools were more attractive than our homes. So it's a pleasure to go to our schools. It is not so anymore. I mean, when you look at schools, generally in this country, and the roofs are leaking, I mean, there are no toilets. Everything is wishy-washy. Nobody has taken time to clean the environment. Even though people are paid to do so, the children are not motivated to go to school. They are just being forced to go to school. So let's look at that infrastructure. That's a roadblock. It has to be attractive. They can't see further. They can't see that if they suffer through it, eventually they are going to benefit. They are just not interested. Just go around now. Even in Lagos, metropolitan capital, one of the best cities in the world. Go around and find out what is happening in the schools. You see no desk in some of them. Some of them, the desks are all gone. Nothing attractive. During our time, we all have where we sit. We all have our desk. And the teachers are very interesting. If you are not seeing the board properly, they will move you to the front. They were personal. They behave like our fathers and our mothers. Teachers are no longer motivated. Teachers are looking at an opportunity to jump out of teaching. And that is not good. During that time, teaching was top class. In any community, the headmaster and perhaps the chief medical director of the area, they are in co-op. So there are roadblocks in terms of infrastructure. There are roadblocks in terms of 
personnel. Now you go to schools and you hear that teachers are bringing goods in to sell. I mean, how is that going to help the educational welfare? It doesn't. So we need to get teachers that are motivated, that we, everything they will do is just to teach the students. And of course, to do that, you have to recruit the best of them and you have to pay them well. Even the universities are at fault here. Yeah. How? Yes. We are in the system. Yes. Tell us. Give us the universities are at fault because when we, are, uh, when we ask for admissions, most of the kids, they they don't want to go to the faculty of education. Ditto for agriculture, I can tell you that. So what they would like to do is to look at the profession of now. They want to be accountants, they want to be economists, they want to be engineers, and of course they want to go to college of medicine, they want to be doctors and so on and so forth. In fact, because of the demand for nurses overseas to get into a nursing school now within the university for a BSc nursing science, you need to score better than that who is going to do pharmacy. And and those are the type of challenges we have that the external influence, the external market, it should, but it should not have such a huge effect on what we're trying to do. Okay, so you've spoken a lot about schools and uh, primary and secondary school education up onto the tertiary level. Recently, private secondary school owners have been asking for support from the federal government. Do you support it? Many people have been saying, you know, federal government shouldn't support because they are private entities. I would like your own personal no, so, take on it. Well, support for what? What's the support support plans. For, oh, in respect of the COVID-19? Yeah. Well, honestly, I believe that federal government should give some support to private institution after they've met certain criteria. And what are those criteria as you want performance. To criteria of performance. I mean, I remember, you know, during that time, they discouraged large intake into schools. Schools were regulated in such a way that every school will prepare students that will pass the Cambridge examination. Every student, every, every school. So you might see some of them, they will say, oh, only 10 of them or so will do that examination. And of course, the 10 will pass. And they said they have one. 100% pass. And based on this, they will get some grants from government. We can give them grants, but it has to be performance based. It has to be based on what they are doing. You see, the inspectorate division of the Ministry of Education, they need to get up and walk, you know, in a way that we can all see, not walking and we don't know what they are doing. So, what I'm saying is that we can actually monitor, we can evaluate those schools, and if they are, they are contributing to the national something, we can give them something. But I, I, I want to say that it's, it's important to make sure that the public schools are also supported in a much larger way because the graduates of private schools cannot leave this world without the graduates from public schools. In fact, I could say that during our own time, it is more popular to go to a public school than a private school. Few people go to private schools. Most people go to public schools and even the non-public schools are the mission schools and the private private are there and they are known for certain things. I mean, in those days, if you want to send your child to a private school, it's probably because of discipline. You probably felt that, well, you know, I don't have time, my wife doesn't have time, and I want somebody who can take care of my child in such a way that will be disciplined. So you send it to a private school, most of which were boarding schools. Even at primary level in that time, my younger siblings went to such schools. Uh, that's what we have to distinguish. I say, you give them money was based on performance as to what they are doing. Okay. So yeah, you've been in the educational sector <laughs> for about I think 40 years mm -hmm. or so. Yeah, which is also a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you've seen the old problems. If you have the opportunity to go back actively into the public sector educationally, what do you think you would want to change? Uh, Sorry, yes. what were the few things you actually changed while you were there? So? Well, I'm happy and um, I thank God that the institution that I had the opportunity to lead, a few things changed. For example, the University of Lagos was developed into being the best university in Nigeria for about three years consecutive in terms of evaluation by not only NUC, by even webometrics, we did quite well. The research output of the university was very good. The infrastructure development of the university was also very good. So, and our students are doing excellently well in the industry because we also persuade them on certain levels of behavior that if, if you want to be recognized as a gentleman, you have to start behaving like a gentleman. You must be able to 
have discussions face to face with elders and hold your own and show why you are holding your own. You know, it's just on facts. It's not going to be on illegalism and harassment. Also, the new one which I went to set up at Ebenyo you know, is we are there. It was more of developing infrastructure, and we did. And we also not only infrastructure <coughs> in terms of various buildings that is seen very well for those universities, also infrastructure in terms of human development and human potentiality. Teachers are there. In fact, I myself, I marvel on the level of success. But what intrigued me most in Ebony is the quantum of intelligent young people, young women, young men, that we see that they probably will have been left out if that verse has not been established there. I was one of those who are opposed to establishment of a university when the big ones uh, does not have anything to do. But I could see that our mindset could not have allowed those people who are excluded to be included. So, um, of course, I've done a few other things in my other aspects. I was president of the Nigeria Academy of Science. We were mm -hmm. able to get the federal government to show interest in our potential. So these guys are there. I mean, this is an academy whereby one of the leaders, I think just passed on last year, Professor Yenuga, became a professor in 1948. That's before I was born. I mean, under the strict, as it's a British system. And we have so many of them, you, you know, who are the people who actually came out with this idea of animal husbandry, poultry. You know, uh, well, you will not know. The ants, they just roam around before. This guy came out with uh, a scheme whereby they, what we call uh, chicken rearing or whatever. So, there were great people in this country, right from the beginning. I said, there are great men of science. So, you want to talk about the late Professor King Kube, who, who was on hypertension and so on. So, so, I was president of this, and I confirmed my quota that government will need to be using such people. Government will need to use them. Then there are brains there. Look, even if we are going to use quota system, within every sector, let's pick the best. In every sector, every region, okay, of this country there are excellent people people who are paired with anybody anywhere in the country but we don't use them because everything we do is politics and that is one of the roadblocks in this country i was amazed when one of the governors was saying well the problems in NDDC, we should use technocrats. I said, oh my God, what did I hear him say? Technocrats? Is he remembering technocrats? Of course. That's why the president himself was given the ability to pick his ministers. The ministers should be technocrats. I mean, when you look at the Ministry of Education in this country, and you see those who are technocrats, you will see their performance. I, I don't know why we do this. This is a great country. That's enough for everybody to do. Everybody should kind of express himself. But because of these roadblocks. You know, you, you work very hard and coming back home, talking about the issues we have, the issue of corruption. I believe if we do a proper education, spend money on education, corruption will go off. Because when you look at it, what are you going to get? What are you going to do with all this? Because education will tell you about the value of money and use of money. Because if you're educated, you know really that the day you die, that's the end of money. They'll tell you all that. Even though religion is supposed to do so but people don't believe it they are not sufficiently patient to understand the fundamentals of even this religion and uh, when you see how we acquire then you start to wonder where, where is it taking this money that's why i thought every government should spend if i have my way not less than 50 percent of the revenue on education let it be an el dorado for education so we know that the area boys who does not want to go to school, who does not want to be empowered through proper things, are just cast away. But right now, they are holding everybody to ransom because we don't even know how to protect them. So everybody takes loss to himself, you know, and so on and so forth. That, that is the reality of the situation. Yeah, I mean, you spoke very passionately about this question. Well, it is passionate. You know, the reason why I speak like this is that I want to leave this world a better place than I met it. This is a worse place than... I met it. I mean, it used to be so exciting to go to Unguru. Yes, go, Unguru, well, you probably don't know. Unguru is at the tip of the chart. It's in the, what we now call Northeast. After Meduguri, you go to Unguru. There's a train at that time, train line that goes all that way. It's always exciting to get out in the train station and talk to the people and buy some fruits or some food or whatever. It's exciting. Is it now exciting for you to travel to Unguru? 
Uhuru. You can't because of bandits. You love to drive all the way the uh, NYSC was an opportunity to get out of house and go and see the world. Everybody's excited. Are we, are we getting that? Even when you get there, are you treated as one part and parcel of those who are in power there? So that's what I'm saying that we need to be passionate about this. We need to try to reinvent the past. That's all what we need. I mean, people say, oh, is it Singapore? Is it Malaysia? They were below us. They came here to get the fruits of uh, some. I said, of course, yes, they do. Because we had it. Because we were organized in such a way that we can produce it. Not now. I don't understand. Look at even what we eat. Everything is shipped from the north. So we need food. So how can people be talking of separatism at this time? You just look at it. So there is a need to have a leadership. Honestly, I mean, with all respect, we don't have leadership in this country. There's a need to have a leadership that says, look, my people must change. It's an emotional thing. We don't have it. And that's what we need. There was a survey that was done and we are saying what are the issues to really transform this country on a better path. And I think we have about seven, okay, including education, including people just believe they are above the law. They can do whatever they like and get away with it. And uh, it was leadership in totality that had many people say, look, if we have leadership. Of course, leadership also needs followership, but it is the leadership that will show example. Look at the first coming of our President Buhari. Everybody follows through because they knew that with this leadership there, there are no Racism. I remember Ikodu Road. People cross the road. Kai will, I think they call it Kai then, something like that. They will get them and they will start jumping right on Ikodu Road that they should never cross with them because the vehicles, they were killing them off. And the leader says, No, I cannot allow my vote to be killed so wantonly. You are not getting anything. You are not getting It's the same man that has been transformed and aged and come to us. I'm not getting anything. So we need God's intervention. <laughs> 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 I so, so you can see the scientists now really work, but everything has been tried. Really acknowledging the presence of God. God yes, you know, because everything has been done. That's mm. what I'm saying. Okay, so we've had a very, very nice conversation. Thank you. Yeah. But now I need to ask you this very serious question. Okay. Research has shown that the country is experiencing a massive brain drain in the educational sector amongst other sectors of the country. How effectively do you think the country can deal with this challenge, considering that you have worked on similar projects around this issue? Uh, this was uh, during the tenure of General Ibrahim Gatangida and I come and we listed what the country has to do in order to retain their brain because it's a question of push and pull well let me say a few things were done like instituting the national merit award a few things were done by slightly improving the condition of service of teachers a few things were done in terms of infrastructure upgrade i must say that there were quite a few leaps and jumps during the second coming of chief of Basanjo as well so a few things were done but they were not enough it's like the countries they are going to. In those days, they are just advanced country. Not the type of things you are seeing now. That you are seeing some of our people in Lebanon. So at that time, what do you go and do in Lebanon? Some of them would prefer to go to Togo, to just anywhere, anywhere but Nigeria. Can you imagine? It's a disgrace. But where they are going, they don't even have as much as Nigeria. We might be poor here, but if you are still in Twitch, you can get going. So we settled all this. As I said, they did a few days, but they did not do everything. There are two major issues, actually. They First, I can say, is the economy. This economy has to be buoyant. We need to cut our coat according to our size. Yes, we need to improve our infrastructure. We need to improve our security. We need to put a lot of money into education. And we, we need to be transparent. You see, if you are transparent, what it does is that it brings confidence into the lead and they believe that things will improve. We need to give hope that things will improve tomorrow. It was because we didn't give that hope. That is why almost every graduate we are training in the university now, the next step is to travel overseas. So we need to reverse that. We need to make this attractive so that they will not be pushed out from us and they will not be pulled by countries like Canada to come and stay with them in the United States. So that is the issue. We have to improve our economy. We have to be transparent in terms of what we do to that economy. Our actions have to be accountable. We should be able to reverse it 
people and do the same thing. So those are the type of things that we needed to do. And uh, our politics is messy. I mean, let's face it. I mean, maybe you are conversing what is going on in Edo State now, but yeah. that's, that's typical. I can say that it's typical, even of Lagos State. It's typical because we have not put the right square pegs. We are putting it in the round hole. So there are leakages, there are challenges. This is not necessary. If we have a clear objective of merit, of efficiency, not man, no man. That is the problem. As long as we continue like this, our graduates will finish, they will find their way overseas. Of course, they are still nice to us. They still send some little money to us, you know, from time to time when they have extra when they feel like or when they have a challenge then maybe somebody calls them uh, a name they don't like or and somebody insults a nigerian but to be honest in the united states now from statistics that is getting to us by some of them there in terms of foreign this nigeria is highly regarded so in spite of all what they say when you can get there and you can you go for a job they want you because they know that you type of nigerians you read very well you know and you perform well at work provided you are giving the environment so that's why i can say that it boils down to what uh governor wiki said let's use those professionals Leave these politicians alone. You're a politician, yes. Once you are in the House of Assembly or you are the local government chairman, let's leave that. But in terms of the work that is going to enhance our economy, let's use professionals. Let's get people who are responsible to their profession and to their God in terms of what and what they do. Thank you very much once again. So research has shown over the years that power serves as a major catalyst for any nation's development. And I'm sure you'd attest to that. What do you think are the obstacles restricting Nigeria from being power sufficient? You are a scientist. Hmm. I think hmm. you should be able to stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, had, I, I had the challenge even in my house. Power is very essential. In fact, power, like food, is such that if you don't have it, you can't think. No amount of innovation. If you don't have power for production, power for even intellectual pursuit, power for security, power for just anything. We've seen the privatization and the emergence of all the discos, the genkos, and then the transmission line. I, I, I have been thinking and I felt, look, again, why the money we spent quite extensive in terms of, you know, power plants and and so on and so forth. Even when we had Kenji Dam, you know, we also had a coal plant, Tama plant at Ido there. Mm -hmm. What happened to it? Can't it be modernized? I know that a few uh, power stations in the United States, at least in New York, in Buffalo, New York, and because I've been in that one, they are cold. Some of them are going to nuclear now. Why can't we do it? Why do we have to rely solely on the ones that we've had before? And if you know, even at that time, just was different. I think Enugu was also slightly different. They were able to contain. I was thinking that even if you say we have shortage of parts we generated, I think we are moving close to five megawatts. Yeah, I think we are on five, seven, five, seven, seven nine. Five, which is even better. It used to be three. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, megawatts is too small. Even for a state like Lagos. This is too small. So why don't we break them down and allow communities, cities, to generate their own power on that very simple scheme? They said, they will say, oh, of course we have it. You have it. You have to agree with the discos. You have to agree with the jenkos. And then you can have your own power system it can be a lot easier so i think there is a need to break this down and then allow every group to do that look there will be a company isn't it a good company will have to declare profit and loss and pay taxes so wait for them they are going to pay taxes let them run efficiently they'll pay taxes anybody will be prepared to pay taxes in the case we are by even individuals i'm not talking of factories now we'll have a generator they'll have solar they'll have inverter they also so you can imagine if you are now working you have a factory whereby you have to make things you have to have all of those so the cost will go up and then the station will go up now they are telling us ah now my, my driver will tell me okay oh coming here now is very difficult because they've raised the cost of transportation what is saying i need to raise the speed so that i could take care of this risk so inflation is going up we are running on that even in terms of interest rate you get even if you have money put it in the bank come to almost zero i think they are talking of three four percent per annum so things are not working well if we have power people will be will bring up their initiative and they will establish something. 
So, I mean, you've spoken extensively on almost all the questions I've asked you. Oh, but then, you. yeah. But then, I would like you to rate the government's performance in terms of how they've handled the outbreak of COVID-19 in Nigeria. Do you think they've tried? Do you think you can still find loopholes in them? Uh, honestly, I think they have tried. I mean, I mean, you are the first person saying they have tried. Uh, I think, I think they have tried. Yeah, they, they've done everything. It, it's logistics is difficult. Ah, logistics is difficult. We we were here throughout the pandemic and the, the first set of lockdown. And my wife has to come out with some strategy to distribute some food items, dried food items, rice, beans, gary, and so on, to some of the people around here just on our streets and beyond you know once you tell one of them they will tell each other and uh, before you know it you have a key so when government said they were going to be sending food i said that you want to do it i mean i don't know who was advising them to do that i felt they could have done it and i knew that it's not sustainable even if you get the food people will fight over the food the writer say how can you give me uh the same uh, portion as Mr. A. Don't you know that my children are bigger than Mr. A? When did he have? So it's difficult. But I could see that they made a genuine effort to do it and it failed. So that's why I said they have tried. I mean, I, we have to give it to them that they have tried. They had good intention, but they didn't look at the problem and the logistics of that failure. Of course, what they should have done is that since we all like BVN, okay, and they said markets can open maybe twice a week, even at that time. So why don't you just put the money in the in the account, in the BVN account, rather than create uh, you know COVID millionaires or what do you call them? Well, so why do you, why do you want to do that if you are really truly truly genuine? Because you knew that you can't do that logistics. Uh, or why don't they do it this way? So, okay, those of you who are carrying garbage, because almost every town in Nigeria now has these garbage carriers. They know every house. They know where the gave, gave us. Okay, you are going to be the distribution. Why do you have to create another distribution system that does not know the addresses? You know, it's, 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 uh, it's failure. So there are quite a few of things we can, but I think by and large, the presidential task force, the NCCD, the, They've done well. The people that we watch on television, they tell us the trends, they tell us what they are doing, they tell us what they should do. I think by and large, they've done, they've done well. Or something. But, okay. Uh, the logistics aspect is very bad. Okay. No problem. So let's leave that and then delve into the AFCFT. I stumble on that word very frequently. Oh, uh, okay. What do you yeah. mean by it? Okay, so um, we'll be delving into the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. Oh, okay. So yeah, do you think our country is really ready for this, even though we've signed it? Remember, we t it took us quite a while to, to sign it. Do you think we're actually ready for the implementation of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement? Of course we are ready. Are you sure? Yes. How? Huh? Look, I'm the one who believes that uh, we are behaving... I see we are a small country. Left to me, the Republic of Benin will be part of Nigeria. Togo will be part of Nigeria. In fact, Nigeria will extend so to the country of Ghana. At least Ghana. All those, they are part of us. They are, it is spillover from Nigeria money that they are spending. It's part of Nigeria. In fact, you spend Nigeria money freely in Benin. You know, the power they are using is through Nigeria. The fuel they are using is through Nigeria. So why are we so timid? So I believe, and when you go to the market, I'm going to find that who is trading in the market. If you go to that market and see who is trading, I can tell you that 25, 30%. I don't want to say much than that. And Nigerians, so what's free trade agreement? Why are we, if you go also to the North, Niger Republic, there are Nigerians there. And that's the confusion. So why are we, uh, why are we disturbing ourselves? We should implement it. We should encourage people. Even all those young men, all these are young men that is waiting. The role that China is playing, even in those countries, building them presidential palaces and making rules for them. We should be playing it. So I believe very strongly that this agreement is long overdue and Nigeria can put, look, at one time, Nigeria will send doctors and teachers and uh, other professions, you know, overseas to go and work, just like we had the American coup, you call. 
I think that scheme is on. I don't know whether they are still doing it, but it was a popular scheme. So the whole idea of the UK at that time is to be able to deflate, to reduce, to flatten the rate of unemployment among youth in the United States. You can also do it here. After you do your NYSC, you know, you can go and spend one year or two years in the uh, Republic of Benin or Brazzaville or whatever, or Angola. It's there. If you go to, um, what's this place? Uh, Gabon. If you go to Gabon. So many Nigerians there. In both low and high places. They claim they've been there during the civil war. And they are now, you know, really shown of the show. So I think Nigeria is so big that we, we need to move further and establish, you know, our territory. But then many concerned economists yeah. because my brother was on the presidential committee for the implementation of this and yeah. they were picking issues in that the country does not really have the infrastructural which, background which country nigeria oh. i mean in terms of power in terms of proper access to markets mm -hmm. and all no. so that's one of the obstacles no our people are in the market there okay our people are in the market and I've told you now that even uh, in the paper supply, we are the ones that supply them, okay? And because they are little and we supply them, or because a Nigerian is probably managing their power station, they get power. They get power in put on much more than use in Lagos. They are, see, we are not going to wait until everything we have or we need is supplied. Even the people giving us problems now, China, they don't have everything. I mean, if you go to Beijing, you just, you, you see, but go right down to what the people are saying. When you go, you drive down into the countryside and, and you see them. We are not going to wait until all that is done. Even from what we have, we can. As a matter of fact, there should be a genuine policy, as I said, whereby a Nigerian should encourage our people to go in Africa and go and have that entire Africa. I mean, if it's not profitable, why are all those banks there? Why is UBA, Zeni Bank, Access. you know, Access, why are they there? They are, they are crazy or they don't know what they are doing. So something is there that we need to take advantage of, but we need to have a government that has a purpose. Mm. They'll tell you, oh, it's an independent bank that is not related there. Why Why use your name? Why are you there? Of course, there is some benefit. Okay, so are you aware of Big Brother Niger? Yes, I am. Okay, so you know some persons have been saying they should scrap Big Brother Niger. It should stop airing. What's your opinion about it? I don't even watch it. Okay. I don't think it's a serious but, matter. Okay, but you've heard it, what young people say about it and perhaps you've stumbled on snippets of what happened in the house. I want to hear your thoughts. Do you want it to be scrapped? Do you want it to be left? Do you think it's promoting moral decadence amongst our youth? I mean, I need to hear your honest opinion about it. Well, my opinion is we would like our youth to dissipate their energy in other areas. There are Nigerian youth doing excellently well in IT, various ops. There are Nigerian youth doing excellently well in music, you know, in various arts. But this, is it, do they call it Big Brother or something like that? Yeah, Big Brother Niger. This Brother Nigeria, what, what does it do? What is it going to hurt? Except that it has a youth following. From what I've heard, that it actually uh, encourages moral decadence. I don't think that's what we need. I think we need um, things that will clean us up morally. I think we need to know how to, to clean up those of us who are morally decadent. We can't afford to have such really. So if I have my way, I say they should scrap it. Okay. I say thank you very much, Professor Ibida Kwaobi, for granting and obliging our request. Mm -hmm. So, people, kindly follow us at Tosian Friends on IG. Thank you, and on YouTube. Thank you very much. Yeah.